Yeah. Okay. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this webinar on how to choose the best GI science webinar, uh, GI science master program in Europe. <laughs> My name is Jeroen Verplanke and I'm hosting this webinar together, together with six colleagues, uh, four of which are also in this room and two colleagues are online moderating uh, your chat comments. Um, we'll make a round of introductions uh, in a minute. Uh, to be clear, um, we talk about the best masters, but of course, uh, we'll discuss here the programs that the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation of the University of Twente can offer you. Um, ITC is in how we call the faculty in short, um, offers two international master programs, uh, the Master of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, in, in short MGEO, and the Master of Spatial Engineering, we call Spatial Engineering or MSE. Um, there are, of course, differences between these GI Science Masters. And the purpose of this webinar is to answer the question, which of these is the right master's program for you? In this session, um, you'll be able to find out which program suits best to enable you to address global challenges, wicked problems, and local solutions that might be close to your heart, actually. Um, we'll have a discussion here that will evolve about how each program deals with these issues. Um, the purpose is therefore not to explain so much the content of the programs that we offer. Um, we assume that because you're interested in this webinar that you have already explored a bit the content uh, of our website. Um, my colleagues here and myself all share a passion for using spatial information to address those challenges. Um, myself, I'm a geographer by background and I was intrigued early on by the way ordinary citizens are able to use spatial information in their daily lives and how it can bring insight in uh, for them into the management of their livelihoods for instance. Um, but each of my colleagues have uh, a different relationship with spatial information so um, let's make a short round of introductions. Um, Thomas, Thank what you is your story? Me. So uh, hi everybody my name is uh, Thomas Groen um, I'm uh, an ecologist uh, by uh, training, so I'm very interested where certain animal and plant species occur and of course find out why are they at those places. And for that we can use remote sensing and geoinformation science to find answers and to do, for example, modeling to find out how climate change affects their, you know, uh, suitable ranges. Um, I'm also teaching, of course, in both programs, so I'm involved in uh, both sides uh, and uh, therefore I'm here also to help you find, uh, you know, the best match for your uh, study preferences. And then next to me, Lucas is sitting. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas De Otto. Uh, I'm a geographer uh, in a university, teacher in geosciences. I'm originally from Argentina. And I did my master's here at ITC uh, in, in geoinformation science for natural resources management. And I'm currently working also here at the faculty uh, as a lecturer and a researcher uh, now in the field of geoinformation processing. And here next to me, my colleague, Cheryl. Okay, thank you, uh, Lucas. My name is Cheryl De Boer. I'm originally from Canada. I'm an engineer by training, um, and I did my PhD at the University of Twente right here uh, in governance and sustainability. I've been working at ITC for the last six years, um, most recently as an assistant professor, working on topics such as energy transition, uh, spatial implications of the energy transition, and governance and planning. And finally, my colleague here, Carolina. Hello, everyone. My name is <coughs> sorry. My name is Carolina Hayweit. I did my PhD here at ITC as well on using drones for informal settlement mapping, and now I continue my research in looking how we can make geospatial algorithms more fair and inclusive. Okay, great. Um, so now you know a little bit of who we are, um, and. Um, like I mentioned before, it also now becomes time a bit to have a look who you are. Uh, and we will focus in this webinar predominantly on whether the masters that we offer fit your individual learning needs and style. So for you to make a choice, you actually need to know something about yourself. What kind of a learner are you? Um, and to help you along that, uh, we've created a short online poll with five easy questions. Um, well, Thomas, maybe you can explain yeah, a bit sure. how the poll works. Yeah, so we have a little poll. Um, it's called Mentimeter. And probably in the screen you will already see appear, or there will appear a little link called menti.com. 
And uh, there's also a code that you need, uh, 782349. I do have to peek a little bit here, the code, right? But this will appear also in the screen. So you can go to this website, and if you enter this code, then you will actually see a screen with four simple questions. And these simple questions are actually uh, representing a gradient. And we have left and right on both sides of those questions. And uh, right is not from the right answer. Right is actually from being on the right side or the left side. And they kind of span a gradient. Now, why do we have this poll? It's actually not necessarily for us, but also for yourself to find out a little bit, okay, which side of the spectrum are you? Um, these results that you fill in are anonymous. We can't trace them back to you. Yeah, uh, but it helps you to see a little bit on which side of the spectrum uh, you have an interest. Yeah, um, I will shortly go through these questions, those four questions that we have. And there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just for yourself, what is kind of the learning style that you like? And the questions that we have is, first of all, how do you like to study your topics, right? Is it one by one? Then you should go a bit more to the left. Or do you like to combine topics? Then you should go a bit more to the right. Also, would you like to be uh, following topics in a fixed sequence that's been thought of by somebody else? Or do you like to experiment a bit more yourself and find out by yourself? Then you should be a little bit more to the right. Yeah. Another question that we have is, how do you like to work? Is that on your own? So you're basically in control, but you're doing it by yourself? Or do you like to work together with a group? So basically, you have a joint uh, uh, responsibility. If you like to work on your own, you should be voting a bit more to the left. If you like to do it as a group, you should go a bit more to the right. And lastly, if you would work on global challenges, which are often a very important aspect in both of the masters that we offer, um, would you like to analyze the problems and make them more insightful? Or would you like to work more on finding a solution for these problems? And if you would like to analyze, you should be a bit more on the left. If you like to uh, uh, work on solutions, you should be a bit more on the right. Now, we're not giving away whether left or right is one of the two programs. I think it will become clear after we've had some more discussion during this webinar. But of course, we will discuss this later on again after everybody has looked at these questions and filled them in. And hopefully, these questions are also interesting for you to kind of realize, OK, which one of these programs should actually suit my interests and my needs? And uh, you can fill this in uh, all the time until the end. So the poll will be open all the time. And in the meantime, we will uh, continue with this webinar. And I would like to give the word back to Jeroen for that. Yeah. Um, so, indeed, don't worry if you haven't finished the poll yet. Uh, take the next 10 minutes to, uh, to figure this one out uh, if you want to see the results at the end. Uh, but, indeed, you can also do it. For, hey, you're doing it for yourself to know more uh, about your own learning, learning style. Um, we are recording this session, so you can always look at it again if you, if you missed something. Um, I would like now to uh, turn our attention to Caroline, Cheryl, and Lucas. Um, they will share their opinions about both programs uh, in a discussion. And uh, meanwhile, we also invite you to ask your questions in the chat. I'm seeing that already quite a few people are doing that. Um, after they have finished their discussion, we will try and address as many of the questions as you've posted uh, as we can. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeroen. So I'll be asking some questions to Lucas, who will be representing the Masters of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation. We sometimes call this MGO. And then Cheryl will be representing the spatial engineering. And so I've prepared four questions for them to help explain the differences between these programs. And as Jeroen said, if you have any questions that you would also like to ask, please put them in the chat. Good. So first question. Now, so both programs are, are looking at how geospatial information science can help address global challenges, right? So can you say something about how your program approaches these challenges? Sure. Who's and going first? Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, OK, in the MGO, um, the focus is on the multidisciplinary point of view of global challenges. So the added value of having different points of view. And uh, the NGO, I would say, we depart from the idea that the geoinformation science is a body of knowledge that can be uh, useful for dis different disciplines in different ways. And that's why we have specializations, uh, different specializations. And when we are discussing global challenges, our students, you, um, will be working together with other students coming from other specialities and will bring in your own speciality. So the, the focus is really on working in multidisciplinary teams. That, that's go for MGO, I would say, yeah. 
Yeah, and um, I think when we when we look at our students in spatial engineering, again, you know, if you would like to consider this program, we really are interested in the development of skills um, to apply this kind of spatial information, right? So under what context do you apply it? Under what, how do you solve different program or problems with it? Um, we go from sort of the beginning of problem definition all the way to the end of, of designing a, a problem. And of course, spatial information can play a really important role in that whole process. Okay, so I'm hearing that um, so from MGO, then the idea is that I'm a specialist working in a multidisciplinary environment. Indeed, yeah. And then in spatial engineering, you're kind of looking at uh, when to apply it in which context. Sure, with an understanding of the problem as a, as a whole. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's try to make it a bit more specific for the prospective students online. So let's take an example, right? So uh, as a global challenge, we could name, for example, flooding in Dar es Salaam. So if we have of flooding in a certain area, then geospatial information science is related because then we can see which houses are flooded, we can estimate where the floods are going to happen, we can pre predict new ones, and all these kind of come together in um, geospatial science. Now, if I were a student in MGO, how would I approach this problem? How can I contribute to solving this global challenge? Well, in, in that case, again, well, it depends on your specialization. Mm -hmm. I would say that, okay, we have a a common trait to all the specialization and it's the fact that uh, when you are when you are doing your masters mm -hmm. in geo and geo uh, you are always focusing on the geo uh, information production cycle so you are somewhere in uh, acquiring data processing data analyzing data visualizing data so the production cycle okay. now it depends, it largely depends on your speciali uh, specialization, where your focus will be. If you are doing, for instance, a specialization in water resources management, you may want to see how you use special information to properly uh, model uh, a fluid event, mm -hmm. a fluid event. Now, if you are doing your uh, specialization in and your information processing, you may want to know, well, how can you um, uh, process a lot of information that is available in a way that is suitable to address the problem that you have at hand. So the, again, the yeah. specialization will a little bit tell you um, how you're going to, or which part of the cycle are you going to be addresses, uh, addressing and in which way. Okay. That will be my example for uh, MGO. Yeah, shall I? Uh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, definitely. When we talk about um, looking at it from the spatial engineering approach, right? So we, as I mentioned before, we sort of look at the whole cycle as, as a problem, right? So problem definition. And in, in this case, we would be uh, hesitant to say that we already know what the problem is, right? So we really encourage our students to look at the problems from different perspectives, right? So that it's not necessarily just a technical problem or it's not a social problem or it's not a, a geo-information problem or, or a, a weather problem. Right? So we try to understand how these different issues interact, and then we figure out what role spatial data can play in addressing the problem from that particular perspective. And then, of course, we always like to follow that up with how do we then implement it to, de to design a solution. Okay, so there are some differences there. Yeah. One really, so maybe I'm geo, you're like, okay, this is my specialization, this is how I can contribute, like you were saying about the, um, with the data workflow, right, of the production. And then from spatial engineering, you're more taking a broader look to try to start defining the problem in a different way. Yeah. And I think a, maybe a nice thing to highlight mm -hmm. is that, well, okay, we, we depart from the idea that uh, there is a spatial uh, aspect to the problem and we are addressing this mm -hmm. problem when we are an NGO. What I'm hearing from, from Fred, uh, Cheryl is a little bit, well, okay, what is the problem as a whole? And then you see, uh, well, where spatial data may play a role, right? Yeah, a certainly. Bit... And, and if we're talking about global problems, then spatial, spatial information, spatial data mm -hmm. almost always can play a role, Yeah. right? So helping yeah. you to better understand the problem, helping you to communicate the problem to different stakeholders, there is often a role for spatial data in these kinds of global mm -hmm. problems. Yeah. Right. So global challenges, sometimes we also talk a lot about wicked problems, right? So wicked problems are like social or cultural problems that are really difficult to solve because there's often a lot of people involved and there's a lack of information. So again, looking at these wicked problems, could you explain the approach from your different, um, from the different programs? Again, from uh, MGO point of view, I would mm -hmm. say for wicked problems is a little bit well, the same. Um, we focus on modeling the problem, mm -hmm. but again, the 
spatial aspects of the problem. So what is the spatial um, aspect of mm -hmm. it, the dimension of it, and then try to model it and find a way to make this um, geo-information production cycle mm -hmm. usable for this very problem. Yeah. But the focus is really on, well, modeling, but always from the spatial perspective. And then we see, well, how can this cycle really help me addressing this problem in one way or another? Mm -hmm. I would say that that's a little yeah. bit like the, the general uh, view from, yeah. from MGO. Yeah, and uh, uh, spatial engineering, actually, the wicked problems is one of our core areas, right? So it's really something that we think um, that you can solve through the application of uh, technical engineering, spatial information, uh, and spatial planning and governance. And so we actually include all these things in the way that we help uh, help you to solve these global problems. Um, we embrace the wickedness to some extent, right? So we really use it to allow a holistic understanding of the problem to ensure that the types of interventions that we design are actually going to provide a solution which is valuable for the people uh, or plants uh, in, in the area. Yeah. Okay. So this is a lot about the, the content. I think we've talked a lot about the differences already between the two of them. But some of the questions that are asked on the Mentimeter are also a little bit about learning style, right? So like, what, what kind of learning style do you like? What do you think is good for you? So can you say something about the differences in the approach of the learning style from the different uh, programs? I will let you show you oh, some. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is actually a really nice mm -hmm. uh, a nice uh, discussion point for for us because the learning approach is something that we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about mm -hmm. because we understand as teachers how much of an influence that has on 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 you on the students. And so in spatial engineering, we purposely put in a lot of group work. Um, and the groups in spatial engineering are made up of people from very different disciplines. And so we really put a lot of attention in how do you operate in a group, right? So we also support that with skills on project management, also other things like academic skills and intercultural skills, because we really believe that solving these kinds of wicked, you know, global problems happens well in teams. Um, another aspect is that we use project-led education, right? So yes, we use group work, but almost all of the knowledge that we give uh, we, that we give you is is related to these problems, and so we really want uh, you to apply it to a particular uh, uh, yeah problem or approach. Right. So a lot of interdisciplinary teams, a lot of group work, really from the beginning, right? A yeah. lot of group work, a lot of project work. Definitely, and we we put a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. on the students to really take their own learning approach. Right? So to really look, um, for example, what, you, what do you like right? and, and allow you the flexibility to incorporate that into the way that you would approach a particular problem. Okay. And in MGO? Well, in MGO, well, I see a lot of things that are actually common. Yep. Uh, I would say that the main difference is that um, for MGO students, we uh, go a little bit more slowly uh, building up the independence. So we, we uh, of course, aim at independent students and independent professionals, mm -hmm. but we are building this up gradually. So um, in, in a very practical uh, example, though, is when you start the program, you will be, uh, you will be uh, confronted with a more uh, traditional uh, way, I want to say, way of teaching. Mm -hmm. So you will be more um, monitored, uh, I want to say more accompanied uh, during the first, uh, the first part mm -hmm. of the course. And gradually you are, you are taking more and more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the program, by the uh, phases of the thesis, when you're working alone with your research, uh, then you are working really as, as independent. So we mm -hmm. um, let them work really alone yeah. because uh, mm, we also believe that is we need to build mm -hmm. independent professionals, but we are doing it in a little more. Yeah. Now the the teamwork is also very much present in uh, mm -hmm. in the NGO, from this uh, point of view of multidisciplinarity. So it is a point of uh, of of meeting for the different specializations. I would say. Okay. Yeah. So then, from what I understood, then NGO also involves group work, but there's perhaps less emphasis. Yeah. 
and that maybe in the beginning, so from spatial engineering, really from the beginning, you have a lot more open groups and maybe a, a less structured assignment. So it's like a lot more freedom, like, okay, this is a problem, try to find a way to solve it. Whereas maybe from MGO, it's more like, okay, this is what the objectives are, you should follow these steps. Exactly. Yeah. While you're developing your specialization and more towards the end, now that you know the basics, so then we get into more abstract uh, problem definition. I would say that this, this, uh, this, um, 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 ability of the students of this this skill to mm -hmm. select and we, we off, uh, build your own career we also want to build it but uh, in the first phase we kind of guide them a little bit more yeah. so we make sure that during the fundamentals of the course well we are all are doing um, kind of the same mm -hmm. and then from the moment they are passing to the specializations mm -hmm. they start all a little bit working on their own um, study path, yeah. building their okay. own study path, I yeah. would say. So there's still freedom in MGO as well. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah. But it's coming a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and maybe if I could just add to that too, that um, <clears throat> when you join spatial engineering, it's not as though you're always doing group work, right? So we also have opportunities for uh, for choice topics where you follow your own, um, your own ideas mm -hmm. and that you can be taught in a more traditional, okay, a yeah. more traditional yeah. way. And then of course, all students uh, at the end of the program do their thesis individually. Right. So yeah. even though in, in spatial engineering, we do do a lot of group work, it doesn't mean that you will always be in a group. There is definitely opportunities for your own individual yeah. contributions. OK, so it's just more a bit where the emphasis is. It doesn't yeah, mean exactly. it's only going this to be one way or the focus. other, but just to show the differences in focus. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Lucas and Cheryl. And I want, I, we promised to leave some time to answer some questions from the chat. So you don't. Are there any questions from the chat? <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks Thanks a lot for this uh, enlightening discussion. Uh, there's actually quite a few uh, uh, questions coming in, uh, in, the, in the chat. So um, I, I do want to throw these your way. Um, some of the questions are, are, like, are really technical questions. Uh, others are, are really like, which, which way should I, should I be choosing? Um, I just want, just want to get the, the there's two quite technical questions which I want to get out of the way first. How much do you know? You know, how much do you know? How much can, can you answer? No, but uh, there's one question here, intriguing. That it's it says, well, what's the future of Google Earth Engine in the field of remote sensing? Uh, <laughs> Does that sound more like an wow. engineer or uh, spatial engineering? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Uh, I can say uh, that. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm also not a fortune teller, so I can say what the future is. But <laughs> I think I think uh, the Google Earth engine is actually well taking a lot of uh, place in uh, analyzing information. Uh, so it's it's been more and more present um, as a well uh, an option to process your information. Yeah. What I can say for the person who's asking is that if you do the NGO, you will be learning something about, <laughs> uh, something more detailed yeah, about yeah. the Google yeah. Engine. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I, I think also it, it, what is what it should be clear in the programs is that we're not teaching software. You know, so um, there, there's all you can see that also in science and education, there's a clear move away from proprietary software. So of course we teach with uh, our uh, ArcMap and, uh, and these type of uh, programs, but um, we're also, you see, there's also much more move to uh, uh, learning how to program your own, uh, your own tools, your own analysis, and how to work particularly also with open source software, uh, where there's much uh, open data, open science uh, in these directions. So you have quite a bit of freedom to choose which kind of tools you would like to use uh, in your analysis. Yeah, I think I can, I can add to that that actually it's very important what Jeroen just said. Uh, we are not teaching software but we are teaching something much more relevant, which is, well, your skill to be able to find a way to understand whichever software you want to use. So I think the focus is again on that. Well, which are the principles? What is that I want to do? And then what, which, has, which are my options? And I'm completely capable of going online, find the software, find the help, uh, mm -hmm. read it, and make my, uh, find my way to, uh, to, to, make it, uh, to make it work. So I think this is a much relevant skill that we are mm -hmm. addressing. Yeah. Perhaps shortly add to that, um, a Google Earth Engine is only one platform. There's many platforms available, and uh, we're also more and more moving towards you know, cloud computing, and that doesn't necessarily only have to be Google Earth Engine, right? There's other platforms mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. and we're also developing our own uh, 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 web services to address this. We've got Crips, which is a, 
a kind of a, our own cloud computing a cluster to help students you know experiment with this as well so that's mm -hmm. actually embedded in both programs mainly through specialization courses that both MGO and spatial engineering students can choose from mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There was another question about programming and programming tools, so that's immediately answered then as well. That is actually good. There was actually an interesting follow-up to that because of, we were talking about hey, what, what are you learning and how are these things happening. It says here, are the master's programs tilted towards the job market or getting, getting or towards, uh, let's say, to the private sector or towards academic research? Well, I think uh, for the MGO, I see two clear um, path, uh, career trajectories that are possible. Uh, on one hand, you have um, the possibility to work as a consultant, uh, um, let's say uh, mid-hierarchy consultant, like leading a GIS uh, or coordinating a GIS team, for instance, something like that. So you know, uh, you know how this cycle uh, behaves and then you can coordinate people who is taking care of this th the different parts of the cycle. You can coordinate that. You have this over, uh, overall view of the cycle. And another uh, possible uh, career path is, of course, research, so more academic. So then as a researcher, you want to improve this cycle and see where you can make a difference, go a step further, uh, obtain more benefits from spatial uh, information. So this is a very, uh, another very interesting path following a, an academic uh, career. That, that, that we see, I see these two as the main uh, yeah. possibilities for MGO. Yeah, so following on that for spatial engineering, um, certainly both options are, are possible. Um, and while research um, could be a follow-up for spatial engineering, certainly a consultancy track is more likely. Right, the way that uh, the way that you incorporate different types of information, the way that you work in an interdisciplinary team, really leads you towards a career or, or the option for a career working in interdisciplinary teams, um, working in and managing. Right, so the more experience you get with understanding the different roles of different people in a team, the more capable you are of eventually leading such a team. Good. Um, so. Um, Say, um, there's, there's somebody here who says, um, what is the best match for a student which is interested in forest and land cover and land change assessment? Very specific question. <laughs> this person knows what they want. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, but we can fight about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would it, say, I would be very precise and I would say, you should do the NGO <laughs> natural resources management, yeah. Yeah. of course. Yeah, although, although, there, mean, although there is, there is a specialization in MGO that would really yeah. cover that quite well. Yep, it exactly. also deals with quite a lot of different disciplines, you know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So before you head over to the MGO, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good to uh, to mention that we certainly address these kinds of issues in our projects, right? So if you want to go more into the details and to the exact science of, of such a topic, then yeah, perhaps MGO is, is better for you. If you're more interested in the application of that kind of knowledge and understanding where it fits in addressing these kinds of wicked problems or the global global issues that we talked about before, then I really think that spatial engineering is a better option. I, I think again here is is very uh, is very obvious the difference. So yeah. again, if you want to do the, the spatial aspect of it, really work with land cover maps mm -hmm. and and focus on 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 the on the spatial dimension, then is NGO. Now, if you want to see how this behaves in the context of a biggest problem, mm -hmm. then you may want to do something more related to MSc. Yeah. Um, then there was, um, well, I think one of the questions, uh, also many of the questions coming in deal with remote sensing. Yeah? If you want to mm -hmm. study remote sensing, this and that, I think for that, more or less, our advice would be quite clear that if you're really interested in doing remote sensing, then the geoinformation science yeah. observation yeah. masters would be like the, the way to, the way to go to, you know, yeah. that's, that there's, a, there's a much stronger focus on that speciality uh, in, 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 in that program. Um, uh, there is also another in interesting uh, question. So, uh, I want to know which global problems involving geospatial techniques are still untouched upon. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, well, you want to know what we don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, interesting. You know, yeah, but there. Well, there's annually we have about 
100, 150 MSc research topics on offer mm -hmm. for our students, right? That count for both programs, and the faculty offer those to, to all programs uh, the same, the same kind of topics, and some are more suitable for the one program or the other program, but there's a wealth of topics and things that we still want to figure out, you know, there's... It's actually a bit of an invitation to start talking about what we do do. Yeah. 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 We should say, yeah, we do climate change, we do global health, we do uh, urbanization. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it's a bit hard to say what we do not do. That's yeah, uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah, but, well, there's a, there's a couple of questions like that uh, indeed in here. Uh, one uh, student is asking, um, uh, let's see, um, I'm getting lost in the list now. Um, can I do an MSc in uh, Geoinformation Science specializing in public health at ITC, for instance? It's a good question. Uh, that, that depends on when you're starting at ITC. Um, I think from the next year onwards, we will have courses on geohealth in the Geoinformation Science Earth Observation Program. There are, will be elective courses. That means they are actually to be chosen by both programs uh, in that case. Uh, probably for a year a year later, we will actually have a specialization on geohealth in the MGO program. So that, that might be, I mean, but, but it's, it's so obvious, it's a hot topic. It's something that is, uh, is something which is newly being developed and uh, we're, we're getting this on board. So that, that is uh, for, um, certainly, certainly an issue. Um, then there is, um, uh, are there any opportunities for inter-university collaboration or online mobility program to between a few universities? And that is then specifically given that the post-COVID times it become easier to coordinate and accept online learning. <laughs> wow, that's also another big question. I yeah, maybe I can yeah? answer it to, to some extent. So one, uh, one way to do that is that we are a member of the ECIU. Right, so and that's the European Consortium of Innovative Universities, and across these different universities, so there are twelve to fourteen of them, I think, at the moment, uh, and so we offer challenges um, for students to collectively work on social problems with students from all of these different universities, and of course, so before COVID, there was the idea that that students would travel to the different uh, universities and work on those particular problems, but we're definitely in the um, in the process of figuring out how can we do that best in a digital form. Right. Good. Um, okay. Before we touch on, 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 on our remaining questions, um, I think it's also uh, good to check back on the poll that we asked in the beginning and see, yes. see what came out of that. Um, so maybe Thomas, we can, can yeah. have a look at the results. It would be nice. I'm not sure if we can get the results out. Ah, very nice. There we go. So we see that a bunch of people filled in the poll, and uh, what you see is uh, looks a bit like heaps of sand. But these are actually uh, histograms, so they show a bit how many votes were, uh, you know, how the votes were distributed across the axis. And uh, what we see is quite a nice spread, especially in the first two questions. And so we have people that are very much on the left and people that are very much on the right. And of course, the average will be, yeah, that's where the dot is, that's the average, right? that's somewhere in the middle, that's kind of what you would expect. Um, so what is nice to see is that actually there's people that are interested in the left side, which would I, I would think uh, uh, communicate most with the MGO program, right? So that is where you uh, are taking a bit more by the hand in the beginning, one by one, but of course in the end you're being, uh, uh, make, make your own choices uh, later on. Um, so the fixed sequence is also basically more on the left, right, and, and uh, having a bit more of a mix is more on the right. So people who voted mostly on the left would be mainly uh, MGO students, and if you're a bit more on the right, then actually you will be a bit more a spatial engineering student. Uh, what I think is very interesting, when I look at the last bar, uh, that actually most people want to develop solutions and not that many people want to uh, actually analyze the problem, although there is a little hump, I think, on the left side. But, uh, and I think this is kind of interesting because most of our students are normally problem solvers, right? I think that the biggest challenge as supervisors when we supervise our students is, is that they want to rescue the world, right? World peace is normally our uh, objective of our study. But of course, this is not possible. So we have to kind of minimize it to a manageable object. And uh, that is often a bit more in the relationship of, of analyzing. Although, of course, in spatial engineering, there's also room to say, okay, a feasibility of a certain intervention, to what extent can that lessen the burden of a problem? So I think 
uh, you should kind of think a little bit back. What did you fill in in this uh, poll, right? Were you more on the left side or were you more on the right side? And that might help you a little bit. Now, if you were in the middle, then uh, you're basically multi-purpose. You could choose both of them. And then it's a bit, you know, uh, also a matter of flavor. What do you like a little bit more? Um, yeah. Well, there is, there is one question which, which I found related to that, which uh, is about uh, the criteria for the master degree. I mean, there, there are a bit differences, of course, in, in, in entry level, uh, or at least in entry requirements for each program. Uh, how is that with spatial engineering, uh, Cheryl? Well, one, one thing that I think is important to mention is that we do require um, that any uh, applicable students have some experience in two of our core knowledge areas, right? And so that, again, that's spatial information science, technical engineering, or spatial planning and governance. So while you can certainly specialize in one of those, we really like for you to have uh, some additional uh, expertise. Yeah. And Lucas, with uh... in, in the case of MGO, it works a dif little bit different because um, we have this common course at the beginning of the program, uh, which is meant to uh, level uh, all the students or bring all the students to the same level of knowledge about uh, geoinformation science. So this uh, is really we really build these uh, fundamentals uh, for the rest of the program. So um, all backgrounds, I would say are welcome there are some that are preferable of course yeah. also for the student to to yeah. have a, a, a softer uh, um, uh, path in, in in the in the masters but in but we have this uh, leveling instance so we we um we make sure that at the end of this core uh, course uh, everybody is having the same basic knowledge fundamentals of uh, mgo um so this is a little bit of difference yeah. with yeah. this previous ex experience and of, course, and of course i mean and when you look at the criteria or the, the differences at the end uh yeah uh the end qualifications of, of the program of course I, I think it's either i think in the study guides of course we also have all the the learning outcomes huh, for the i think if you compare those if you put those next to each other you also see a bit more like what is expected of you uh through, throughout the program perhaps it's interesting to mention here's also the online open days eh, where both <laughs> programs actually uh, spell yeah. out these uh, learning outcomes much more explicitly and uh, yeah then and this will this will be in a couple of weeks so yeah. that's um that, that is something for for people more interested in the content of the program of course you yeah you really you will be invited actually you will be invited if you participate here and you left your email address you will be invited for that online open day and there you will learn much more specifics about the content of these programs um so there's many questions coming in really specific okay i can do this so where should i should i go there you know or uh, like this if you want to combine gis uh and you uh, and uh, look at urban GIS, for instance. Uh, I I IoT for urban GIS. I don't. Internet of Things. Internet of Things, mm -hmm. for urban GIS. Mm -hmm. Which MSc should I choose? Well, um, I s I'm not sure about uh, <laughs> the answer, but I would say uh, I would I would say for if you're choosing MGO, it would be a a, a fit for that, yeah. especially. Um, the specialization on urban management and also uh, geoinformation processing. In both, you will, you can work with Internet of Things applied to uh, urban yeah. Uh, yeah. developments. Yeah, I don't know if it's also a fit I would for. No, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. In, in that and case, it certainly is. There's there's this, there's this, uh, another question similar, but that says, okay, I'm, I really want to uh, know the application of uh, applied remote sensing for mineral exploration. Well, I mean. Well, this is also very specific. This yeah, is um, we have a specialization. Uh, we for have that. a speciali specialization yeah. exactly for that. So, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. That, I think that's that's. Uh, we want to put it in the broader context of the effect of mineral exploration <laughs> on you know uh, you know people that live in the area and stakeholder perspective. Then probably you then you move, move to the other one. Yeah, to yeah. the other one. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, then there's of course there's another uh, question by somebody who probably. Uh, read quite a bit about the, the, the program is on offer because it also talks about the the gem program the yeah. for environmental mental management program uh, that is a joint program that itc is part of that is really, yeah um they said what what is the best for an urban and environmental planner to choose uh, that's also that is a bit uh yeah apples and pears uh, apples and origins as you say if you want to compare that again with these programs but it it has a different approach it is of course a program which 
put you in different locations. That is really a program where you are going to uh, do, you choose whether you do part of it in, in Sweden, you do part of it in uh, Estonia, you do, do or, and then you do your second year either in the Netherlands at ITC or you do it in Belgium. Uh, there's different universities involved, so it's, it's a different approach. Um, probably it would be quite, yeah, partly uh, similar to what the MGO program is offering, but MGO is offering it you from, from one location, actually, and that's, yeah. and that's, I think that's, that's the biggest, the biggest different difference there. Um, um, I have, uh, how is the labor market related to GM, GMO? What, what is GMO? I'm lost for Genetic modified organism. <laughs> I, I would know we are not really into genetic <laughs> modification. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the GMO stands for, but uh, the, in terms of the labor market, um, you know, I, for NGO, I can I can say that uh, what, what was the latest statistics? About seventy percent of our graduates have a job within three months after graduating, something like that. So there's plenty of jobs. I think it's quite a broad spectrum for which you're being trained, right? You're, well, you're perhaps it's nice to mention is that both programs in principle also have an internship, right? So uh, in the spatial engineering, it's compulsory. In NGO, it's uh, uh, facultative, it's, but it's also possible, right? Yeah. And there, uh, what we see is that a lot of students actually do this internship, and when it's a good match, that also helps them very much in, in uh, getting a job. So some people actually got a job through the internship. So this link with the job market is also kind of embedded in both the programs. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, well, there's, there's not a specific question about uh, MGO, actually, because somebody has a master's degree in geography. What would be the better choice to choose a, 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 then another master's in geoinformation science and earth observation or the postgraduate diploma course in geoinformation science and earth observation? That's, of course, an interesting question. I mean, um, if you say, okay, for my own CV, I have already my, uh, I have enough on my master's and I want to know more skills, then of course the postgraduate diploma course would be could be something for you because that is then really a diploma. It's not a degree, an additional degree you get, but you follow the courses from the first courses, the first year of the MGO program. But it doesn't then prepare you for your research in the second year. It ends with a practical assignment, and you 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 just have the skills learned. Yeah? So it's it's a different thing. It's really uh, it's not a degree and. It depends on your personal uh, choice, and of course, the postgraduate diploma will only take you one year, and a master's diploma, a master's degree, will take you another two years at least. To, uh, to but I also think I would say also from our geographer yeah. point of view. So geography is kind of a transversal science that yeah. is used for many. Uh, by many others and GI science is a parallel science to geography is also used for many others and actually your background as a geographer you can use it anywhere in as a, as a GI scientist if you are ready to convert to a GI scientist uh, up, uh, upgrade to a GI scientist <laughs> well I, I should not say that but if you want to switch um, then it's really uh, up to which is uh, your field of application where where is that you want to apply uh, your ge geographical knowledge, because as I said, it's transversal. So it, the knowledge that you have about how, in, how to understand this, the space is, is the same. The, the point is, which is the specialization? Do you want to do it for natural resources, for water management, for urban uh, issues? So this is really the point. And your background as a geographer will always be useful. Um, yeah, I think you would agree, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a geographer, so that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but there is, of course, uh, a, a bit of an idea of the generalist versus the specialist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. again, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, yeah. And that, and that is, I mean, what would you say for, for NGO? What, what does it favor? As a graduate? No, well, I, yeah, it's, it's the specialization, right? Yeah. So this is the point. Yeah. Uh, that that you get the you get to know how to use all this baggage of information, J information, mm. applied to a specific yeah. uh, field, and this is this is an added value also. Then you are getting uh, um, you are it's both for the one who is coming from a general science like a geographer, then it will be a geographer with a specialization in a very concrete field, and the other way around, mm. then you be a you can also be a geologist, which will have a specialization in spatial problems related to geology. Yeah. So it, for both work very well, I would say.
mm. but always the point here is the specialization. Yeah, so you, you, MGO uh, caters for like a broad spectrum of indeed specializations that yeah. come in and learn how to specialize to address geospatial issues exactly. again. And how is that for spatial engineering? Well, and, and I, I think it's a bit, um, it's not a, exactly correct to use the word generalist when we talk mm -hmm. about spatial engineers. Um, I think it's more that they're able to tap into all of these different specialties that we have here at ITC, for example. So all of the different um, prof uh, professors and, and researchers, all of that information is available to them, right? And so when they see that the need is there, they can really, you know, go to these people and say, you know, help, help me learn this a bit better. Um, and to me, that, that is not being a generalist, it's learning how to incorporate different types of information into solving a particular problem. Yeah, I think we, think we can add actually for spatial engineering uh, students also, we see quite specialized thesis topics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so people start rather broad as well, but they sometimes still tend to focus a bit more in their individual thesis area where they mm -hmm. uh, basically apply uh, a very specialistic knowledge to a, to a more general uh, problem. So yeah. actually there is yeah. also a certain level of specialization yeah. also in the spatial engineering students. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I think also uh, when you start thinking, uh, because we're moving already a little bit into, into content of programs, uh, so that's, um, we can talk for hours if, if we need to for that. But I think also when you, when you look at, at where, where lies the focus of each program, it's a bit, um, yeah, it's, it's different to pick to pick something uh, mm -hmm. to really pick out something because the the programs have so many th much to offer. But I think for MGO, um, we would say that the focus lies very much on on learning by doing. You know, that's um, we make quite a bit of use of all the great lab facilities that we have here at the faculties, and these facilities allow us in MGO to. Um, yeah, to support the theoretical basis that you get from the courses with many practical assignments. So you actually gradually develop your skills uh, throughout the program. We guide you uh, through this. And uh, in many cases, this skill development then helps you become that specialist if you want to, uh, that would be able in the second year to start doing their field work and to collect data for their MSc research and then consequently process and analyze these data into the relevant um, results for your thesis so it's really that that guided skill development that that is is a clear focus of uh, of mgo to to yeah learning by doing again i think how, how is that for spatial engineering thomas um, what do you mean oh well, like what do you if you want to pick out something ah, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I think, of course, also spatial engineering people do have some some more uh, that they can specialize in the end, but they start more generalistic in the beginning, and a lot of focus is also on um, what we call collaborative learning. And so you're not only learning from the teachers, you're also learning by cooperating with other people, um, and by that actually understanding things better yourself. And so that's, I think, uh, kind of a high, well, if that's your cup of tea, right? That could be a highlight in spatial engineering that you learn how to kind of, you know, train your fellow students on things you're good at, but at the same time, you're being trained by them on what they're good at. Uh, if you say, hey, what is really like a nice thing, like a cherry on top of it, uh, we also have this uh, international uh, excursion. Well, last year we didn't have it, obviously, because of the corona situation, but yeah. Yeah, the intention is there, and the first time we had it was a fantastic experience where you actually go with all your fellow students of the same year in the bus, Mm -hmm. And you travel through Europe, going to institutes that actually apply this kind of uh, spatial knowledge to wicked problems and see how do they do this and mm -hmm. a bit of experience. It's not just, mm -hmm. you know, here in the safe environment of ITC to do things, but you actually see in the real world how this is being yeah. applied. And I think that's yeah. kind of a very nice highlight. Uh, yeah. Yeah, M M Geo tries to, yeah th that yeah. is what you do in MGO actually yeah. uh, at an individual level. That's yeah. it is really where you where you start thinking, oh, that's that's where you do your field work. Yeah. You know, it's really where you uh, as an individual, you develop your research and you, you go, well, if you if the topic allows it, you go abroad, and you, uh, you do your field work for these kind of things, yeah. Um, I see uh, another question here about, uh, are there possibilities to make an internship at the University of Twente when a student is coming from another GIS program at an international university? Oh. I can say the answer is yes. I mean, yeah. I've hosted an internship for, uh, from another university <laughs> and it was a fantastic student, uh, very nice. Actually, afterwards he came to do a PhD at the University of Twente, so we were very happy with him <laughs> twice. So yes, there is definitely scope for doing internships here, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah. I don't know if the others have experiences uh, in this context, but uh, yeah. Yeah. no. But, uh, no, but I mean, no, we usually have. Yeah, for, it is definitely possible. Yeah, uh, uh, students here can do internships at other universities as, as well. well. Yeah. So yes, yeah. Yeah. the other way around works definitely. Yeah. As that's well. that's yeah. for uh, internships that are. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be a company. It can also be a research. Uh, related mm -hmm. internship yeah. that you do, but it then has to be at another university. You know, it's, yeah. it's not. We don't allow the internship, a research internship, inside the university. So, welcome to other students from other to other universities. That's. Uh, um, I, I really have a, a well. It's something like a bombshell question here. It's, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> it's, it's great for that side of the table. It's, a, it's a, do you believe that the world still undermines the importance of geospatial uh, GIS or remote sensing? Um, is it no, undermining? I don't think so. I don't no. think so either. No, no, the contrary. No, eh? no, 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 the contrary. I think there is more more room for um, yeah. more awareness. Right? More, more awareness. awareness. Yeah, exactly. yeah. There's a lot of demand actually for yeah. Yeah. Uh, for people who know how to deal with spatial information. That's yeah. actually uh, yeah, it, it's being more and more acknowledged as a as a relevant skill to yeah. and there's to more analyze. and more geo information available yeah. mm -hmm. and more and more people that is aware of this and yeah. is aware of how to manage it no i think and it's, i think it's also in addition to that so we also have some people here working on the ethics of geo information yeah. right so not just you know what can we do technically but also what should we do yeah. uh, under what under what conditions and when is it right and when is it maybe not so right yeah. Yeah. Perhaps also interesting. I think uh, the, the availability of geo information data is also becoming more easy uh, because we have everybody. Has at the moment of choose between a multitude of options in terms of data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think also the, when you talk about the, the growth and of the, or the knowledge of the importance of geospatial information, you also see it a lot in the job market. But I think if you look like these years, there's a lot more in the private sector than there was like five or 10 years ago, where it was mainly more research or public institutes. I think now there's an incredible growth also in the private sector yeah. compared to a few years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah indeed. Yeah. Okay, um, there's another acronym here, which I don't know, so <laughs> let's, let us help you. Uh, isn't there anything that involves NLP and deep learning combined? Isn't that neural language? Neural language programming? Neural language, neural language program. programming. Programming. Yeah. Pooh, that's, uh, that's a very technical one. Uh, deep learning, yes. Um, deep learning, and in general, I would say that it's starting uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I would say in all the deep Departments, there's some kind of. Uh, I'm not sure about maybe Caroline in your department was. Uh, of course. Yes, huh? Ooh, how oh. can you be doubting? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't pay attention to my introduction, eh? We've been there a couple of years ago. No, no, we have a lot of specialists in deep learning in my department. Yeah, exactly. We learning. will talk later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but for sure, yeah. uh, information processing for sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something that is starting, but it's yeah. growing fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. really yeah, that's good. Okay, um, let's um, maybe maybe I can actually um, put in one question uh, about um, well the difference between civil engineering mm. and um, well the, the spatial engineering is that something you could is this. talk about civil engineering as, as a bachelor, of course, that's also very hardcore uh, engineering. Also looking more at context, right? You're also looking more at the, the social problems. But yes, in spatial engineering, we, we do more of that, right? So we, we spend more focus on soft skills, more focus on, on group work. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't learn very important engineering skills, 
right? So systems thinking, right? So problem analysis, all of those kinds of things, you certainly learn at a, at a higher level than what you would at a, at a bachelor's level. Okay. Um, so I think it's, um, it's about time to round off. I, um, I think, uh, well, I hope that uh, for the people here uh, attending, it was an informative seminar. I, uh, we had fun. I think that's, uh, <laughs> sorry. And I hope that you've been able to figure out for yourself a bit what kind of learner you are, and also that will help you to, uh, to choose uh, between the programs. Um, in case you would like to uh, know more about the content of each program, as Thomas said before, um, uh, the university has its open online days, online open days, yeah, oh, online open days uh, for the master's programs that will be in March, 11th March. on 11th of March, yes. Um, so there you will also be able to hear some of the students talk about their experiences uh, in the program. Um, if you have uh, registered your email address, uh, you will be uh, getting an uh, invitation for these open days. Um, yeah, well, there was also one question remaining about will we have a chance to have face-to-face -face lectures in 2021 20, uh, in the fall? And so, yes. Um, we, yes. We hope yes. so, yes. <laughs> we, we are planning, uh, like even this year in, in the program, the start of the program, that was like on the brink of could we or could we do not. Uh, several students started physically in class, others started online. We actually develop our programs in such a way that you can, uh, well, if you're not able to come in time that you can start a program online and then as soon as you're able to come you can start with it physically uh, we go with the flow nobody knows what has happened but we we prepare ourselves to be able to uh, for well we prepare us to be <laughs> ready for anything yeah. and uh, we hope to be able to receive everybody uh, physically uh, um so did i forget anything no i don't think so no yeah. Then with that, um, we thank you for joining us online, and we hope to see you in one of our master's programs. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.